Okay, so we're on qualitative analysis. This is day two of the lecture on 4.2. And uh, today we're going to talk about what procedures can be used to help identify unknown ions in solution. There are a few. The first simple one is just looking at the colored solution can actually help you figure out what's present because specific metal ions have distinct colors. For instance, copper two ions are blue, chromates are yellow, dichromates are orange, permanganate is a deep purple color. I have it in the hood on the left hand side of the solution. Uh, nickel two is a light green. The second test you could do is a flame test. You're going to get to do this in the lab next time. Okay, so you're going to stick salts that have specific metal ions present like lithium, sodium, potassium, calcium. You're going to stick those into a flame and you'll get this really bright distinct color. Um, the ions that have distinct colors tend to be copper two ions are going to be blue green. Lithium ions tend to have a red color. Barium ions tend to be this really pretty green. Um, you can also, while you have the flame um, in that distinct color with the ion in it, you can use a um, hand spectroscope and you can look through the hand spectroscope at the flame and you'll see those distinct bands of color, which we talked about in the fall pertaining to the line spectrum of elements, okay? So that happens from the electrons that got excited, they jumped to a higher energy level, and as they relaxed, they emitted specific bands of color. The last method that um, tends to be relatively important in chemistry for identifying unknown ions is selective precipitation. Okay, so selective precipitation is where you're going to be adding specific substances to a solution that has ions in it, and you will specifically precipitate out a ion and then you'll filter it, and then you'll keep performing that process until you um, have gotten all of the ions out of the solution. Um, a couple of ways to sort of keep track of ions that have precipitated is using a table, which I personally think the tables are a little bit confusing. Um, I like a flow chart. So if you take a look at the flow chart on the next page, this flow chart here is showing you what ions you originally had and what you added to the solution to um, remove specific ions. So you want to select a substance that is going to pull out a single ion at a time because if you pulled out two at a time, you'd have to add something to that precipitate to try and dissolve it to figure out what you really have. So it kind of makes it a little more complicated. So let's take a look here. I have calcium, zinc, and strontium in solution. How do I figure out what I'm going to add? Well, if you take a look back at the solubility rules, the solubility rules are going to tell you, well, if I add a certain substance like sodium sulfide, because if you look at the sulfides, you will see that with the sulfides, your calcium ion is going to be soluble. So we won't precipitate that out. Your zinc is not included there, so I would precipitate out zinc with sulfur. And then your strontium is soluble. So if I add sodium sulfide, and I had this question yesterday, if I add sodium sulfide to a solution with a calcium ion in it, as an example, these ions would switch places. You would get calcium sulfide as a product, and then you'd have an ion, a sodium ion, in the solution. Okay. If you look at your solubility rules, you will see that calcium sulfide is soluble, so this would not form a precipitate. So I wouldn't have to worry about pulling that one out. But if I combine sodium sulfide with zinc, the sodium and the zinc switch places, I'll get zinc sulfide, which if you look at the solubility rules, zinc sulfide has low solubility. This would be a solid. So does this make sense why I would specifically choose that? Um, also, if you had looked at the reaction between sodium sulfide and strontium, you're going to get strontium sulfide. Solubility rules say that that is soluble in water. Okay, so this right here is key. You're pulling out zinc sulfide, okay? So you'll precipitate zinc sulfide, and then you'll just filter it out. And then you'll proceed with the other ions, okay? So then you'll move over here. Here we have 
my calcium and my strontium ions left in the solution, what could I add? Well, if you look at the solubility rules, if we take a look at the hydroxides, okay, the hydroxides, if I have a hydroxide with strontium, strontium hydroxide is actually soluble in water, but calcium hydroxide is not. It has low solubility. So if I put NaOH with something that has a calcium ion in it, the sodium and the calcium switch places, I'll get calcium hydroxide, which is a solid because it has low solubility in water, and then I'll have this sodium ion just hanging out in solution, okay? Whereas if I try to cross my sodium hydroxide with my strontium, the strontium and the sodium switch places, I get strontium hydroxide, which according to the solubility rules is soluble in water, okay? So here I have precipitated my calcium hydroxide. I get to filter that out, and then I'm left with a strontium ion in solution, okay? Then I look at the solubility rules again, and I see, okay, the sulfates, if you take a look at the sulfates, strontium with sulfate is low solubility. So Na2SO4 plus a strontium ion or something with a strontium ion, these two switch places, you're going to get strontium sulfate. Solubility rules say that this is going to be a solid, so therefore I will be able to filter that out. Okay. One of the questions I got yesterday was, well, why are you putting sodium with sulfur? Can't I just add a sulfide ion here and a hydroxide ion here and a sulfate ion here? Well, you're adding a solution of something, okay? So usually these are in dropper bottles and you add them and then you see if a precipitate forms. The reason we picked sodium is because it's in group 1A. And if you look at the solubility rules, all the alkali ions are soluble. So I don't have to worry about that forming some sort of a precipitate with something else in the solution. So Question. Could you pick any um, of the alkali ions? Yeah, you could pick lithium, sodium, potassium. But specifically, you have to also look at what is in, like these are all cations. Like <clears throat> none of those cations are going to form something with the sodium ion because it's also a cation. Okay, so if I give you something like this as a bonus question on the test, could you do it? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let's move on. All right. Do you want to try one yeah. with me? Let's try number one here. Describe a process to individually remove the ions, silver, barium, and beryllium, from a solution. Be sure to list the compounds that you add in order and the method of removing the precipitate. You may wish to use a flowchart. So let's use a flowchart. So we're going to have silver, barium, and beryllium. Okay? We're going to add something. to precipitate out one of them. What would you like to precipitate first? I can make a suggestion. Silver, silver. silver. totally. Great, so we're going to precipitate out silver. So what should I add? Chlorine, chloride ions, chloride ions, right? If you look back at the sol solubility rules, it says that uh, for the chlorides, silver will precipitate out because it has low solubility. So what should I what should I put with um, the chlorine here as a cation? N. Na, sure. Add NaCl. Okay, because if I add NaCl, NaCl plus something with the silver ion, the sodium and the silver will switch places. You're going to end up getting AgCl, which is a solid because it has low solubility, and then you'll just have these sodium ions floating around. Okay? Okay, so here we've got silver chloride precipitating, and we're just going to filter it out. And over here, I'd be left with a barium ion and a beryllium ion. Do I have you so far? Okay. So I'm going to take these two ions, and I'm going to add something. 
so I can precipitate out one of them. Which one would you like to filter out next? B. E. B. A. You can add sulfates. Okay. Yeah, you can add a sulfate. What should I put with the sulfate as the cation? Um, pick one. Na. Na. Okay, so this would be Na2SO4 because the negative two charge in the sulfate would cross down. Okay. So when I add Na2SO4, you're going to end up precipitating out the barium. So you'll get BASO4. This will be a solid, and we can just filter this out. So just to give you a visual here, Na2SO4 plus something with a barium ion in it. The barium and the sodium will switch places because they are both cations. You will produce barium sulfate, which is low solubility in water, so it's a solid and you'll have sodium ions floating around in solution. Now I have this lonely beryllium ion. <laughs> what should I add now? I can give you a hint. Yes, you could do sulfide. You could also do hydroxide. It might be easy to just add sodium hydroxide, okay? Because we usually have that in dropper bottles. If you add sodium hydroxide, what's going to happen is you will get beryllium hydroxide solid and you'll just filter that out. Okay? How do I know this is going to form a precipitate? Well, if you take NaOH plus something with a beryllium ion, bless you, the beryllium and the sodium switch places because they are both cations, you will form beryllium hydroxide which has low solubility in water and then you'll just have your sodium ions floating around. Could you also add like a phosphate or like a carbonate or a sodium ion? You could also add a phosphate, yes, or a okay. carbonate or a sulfide. Okay. Sure. Okay, so there are other variations. Yeah. So you're just taking um, something that would make the ion into a solid. Mm -hmm. So like, okay. And there are, there are many answers possible. Okay. Okay. Can I go on? Okay. Sometimes, would you like to do a lab like this? Like a simple lab like this? Maybe? Okay. Um, let's talk about um, identifying precipitates. Sometimes you may precipitate out something and you're kind of questioning what it is. Like you don't know if it's one compound or another. So let me give you a couple of examples of what you could do if that were the situation. So if I had a precipitate and I didn't know if it was silver chloride or silver iodide, then what you can do is you can add concentrated ammonia and you add it directly to the precipitate and you see if it will dissolve. If silver chloride dissolves, but the silver iodide, the silver chloride, chloride will dissolve, but the silver iodide will not. So this is a really great way to identify what precipitate I have, okay? A second way is to add a really, really strong acid like hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid. If I have something with a carbonate in it, okay? I can dissolve a carbonate precipitate um, by adding a strong acid, and it'll just bubble, it'll form carbon dioxide and water. So it helps you identify what you have. Okay, um, let's take a look at the quick check down here. List three properties that can be used to determine the identity of ions in solution. Okay, well, we can look at the color of the solution, right? What could I do after that? A flame, a flame test. What else could I do? Um, selective solubility or selective precipitation, which you could just abbreviate with solubility. Okay. Number two. Let's skip number two and let's skip number three because we've already done something similar to that. All right, let's talk about hard water. We have hard water here. 
Have you guys ever seen the um, like the white powder that accumulates on the end of a faucet if you don't have a soft water system at your house? Or um, like the soap scum and on the tile in the shower? So hard water comes from uh, a really high concentration of calcium and magnesium ions in the water. Also some ions, uh, or iron ions can be present. If you don't have um, these ions in high concentrations, we would call it soft water. This uh, hard water can pose a major hazard for plumbing and also um, we can form uh, soap scum um, in bathtubs and laundered clothes. I'm going to show you a video on um, hard water and then that's going to be the end of our discussion on this section.